शगम शांतेर दौशातेर दिशा शांति रवांतर दिशा शांति रग्निशांते वायु शांति रादित्य शांति चंद्रमा शांतेर नक्षत्राणि शांति राप शांति रोषद यशांतेर वनस्पत यशांतेर गौशांति रजाशांति रश्वशांति पुरुषशांतेर ब्रह्मशांतेर ब्राह्मणशांते शांति रेव शांति शांति रुमे अस्तु शांति ही में देवी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काइ में देवी पीस इन द वाटर एंड इन ऑल डायरेक्शंस में देवी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स में देवी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स में देवी पीस इन एवरीवन and in everything sarvetra sukhina santo sarve santo niramaya sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashchit dukha bhag bhavet sarvastaratu durgani sarvo bhadrani pashyatu सर्वसद्बुद्धिमापनोतो सर्वसर्वत्र नंदतो मैं ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्थी मैं ऑल सी व्हाट इज़ गुड एंड मैं नो वन एक्सपीरियंस मेजरिंग मैं ऑल ओवरकम देर ऑब्स्टिकल्स एंड अक्वायर गुड टेंडेंसीज मैं पीपल एवरीवेयर फाइंड जॉय एंड फुलफिलमेंट Let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness. As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength and compassion. And as we breathe out, let us release all the stress, anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind. Let us practice this way for a while. Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in everyone, the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts.
ओम शांति 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 ही हरि ही ओम
Om Asatoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Aviravir Mayeti Rutrayate Dakshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahinityam May the Divine lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the Divine Consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. <coughs> um, our subject today is me and my I. Among all the parts of our personality, the one that is most elusive, and in some sense, the one that is closest to us, is the sense of I, the ego. And in the course of a day, we use the, the pronoun I all the time. And therefore, it's, it's helpful to reflect on this word I that we keep using so many times throughout the day. I don't know it's, whether it's possible to do a, a survey of some kind. If we can record in the course of a day everything that we have spoken and analyze the words that we use, it's possible that the word I is used more often than any other L word. It's, that's an experiment that can be tried. But I is, is a word. It's, um, it's a single letter word. It's a pronoun. And when we utter a word, any word, a sound is produced. And every word usually refers to some entity for instance, now, if I utter the word table, now table is a word, and when I utter that word, some sound is produced, and it refers to an object, which I call a table. Now, that object can be either external, in which case my senses can grasp it, or it could be internal, in which case my mind remembers it. So every time I say the word table, it's not necessary that a table has to be in front of me. Even if there is no table in front of me, when I utter the word table and produce that sound, which sounds like table, um, the memory or the form of the table comes in my mind. Now, thinkers have spent a lot of time trying to analyze the nature of relationship between a word, the sound that is produced when that word is uttered, and the object that is referred to. Now we need to keep these things distinct. So normally we say, well, I. So when you refer to I, we just say I. Now this itself is not I, this, this is, the, I is a word. And I, when pronounce it, creates a sound. So this I is, is a name I give to this entity. So there is some object which I like to call by the term I. Now clearly, if someone were to ask me, who are you? Um, one way of answering which would not be very helpful is say, well, I am me. Um, like, like many of the the help menu in some of the softwares. Sometimes the answer may be accurate, but not very helpful. So, um, so I'm, I'm myself, it doesn't really tell me, uh, tell the other person uh, anything much about myself. It seems so obvious. But so a question like, who are you, can be answered in any number of ways. And most of us might begin by just telling what our name is. Now again, the name itself is not myself but the name is one that is connected with this entity. And so who are you? I'm X, Y, Z. But the 
question who are you can be answered in, in any number of ways. Um, but before we go to that, when we then refer to the word I, use the word I to refer to an object, and this is that object, well, this, well, not everyone's eye is not this object. Your eye is, is that's interesting also. The, the pronoun I is some sense special because this object can be called by that word I only by myself. None of you, you will, your I will be, the object you refer to by I will be different. Everyone's I is unique. The object referred to is unique. So that is the question that Vedanta grapples with. What is this object? What is this entity that I keep on referring to as I? What is the nature of that identity? And clearly, the first, the first thing that comes to mind is clearly the body. The body is definitely a part of this entity we call I. But we know clearly it's not just the body, there is the mind, there is also the, what we call the ego, the I sense. All of these taken together is an entity that I refer by the term I. So this ego, the I sense, performs some very important functions in our life. And one of the first function that the sense of I performs in our life is that it separates me from everything that is not me. So the sense of I always comes alongside the sense of not I. It is sometimes said that when, a, when, we, were, when we were born, when a baby is born, for the first few days or weeks, the baby has no sense of I. The baby does not know where its body ends and the rest of the world begins. At some point, the sense of I comes. And we have all, we have all passed through this stage. We were, we were only a few days or weeks old then, so I, I'm sure none of us remembers when the sense of I first came in our life. But at least we can imagine what may have happened. And it seems to be an event that may have produced very mixed emotions. Clearly, a sense of I it gives us the sense that I am someone, a feeling of personhood, that I, I, I am a being. And in that sense, the sense of I is a, good, is a good experience. But alongside the sense of I comes inevitably the sense of not I. The moment I know that this is me, at that very moment, I know that this is not me. This is not me, this is not me, this is not me. And although when we, we are babies, we are too, not yet strong enough uh, intellectually to analyze this too much, but as we grow older, sometimes in a subliminal way and later on in a conscious way, we realize that that which is not me, it's far too bigger than me. That which is not me, is much more powerful than me. And suddenly then, this I seems to be so vulnerable. And the reason stress, anxiety, fear, oftentimes these may not be so visible, but they are there in a kind of a subliminal, in a kind of subtle form in the hearts of all of us. And at the root of this, we have a subtle sense of fear and anxiety and stress, lies the awareness that this me is so small compared to the rest of the world. There are forces out there over which I have no control whatsoever. And I'm so vulnerable. There is nothing I can do if some powerful force, physical, mental, economical, political, say what you want, but I'm too fragile to deal with these external forces. So that's the first thing that this sense of I does. That, and you can see how this sense of I is inseparable from the sense of not I. 
by remembering that when the sense of I disappears, the sense of not I disappears also. When what is not I? What we generally refer to as the world is really anything other than me. So this is me, everything else other than me is the world. Whether filled with people, objects, living, non-living entities, but that's all the world as opposed to me. So everything that is not me is the world. Now, the perception of the world, the awareness of the world is directly related to my uh, awareness of myself. When I'm fast asleep, when I'm not even dreaming, my sense of I vanishes. That time I don't have the sense of I. And because the sense of I does not exist when I'm asleep, the sense of not I doesn't exist either. So in deep sleep, my I goes, the world also goes. When I wake up or when the dream starts, there is the, the dreaming I or now the waking I, and then there is the world. In the waking I encounters the waking world, the dreaming I encounters the dream world. And in deep sleep, no I, no world. So the I and not I are very much related. The other function that this sense of I does is that it's a, it's a coordinator or a unifier. If you imagine a big organization with thousands of employees, each with specialized jobs, but no one to coordinate the various departments and activities, then there's going to be chaos. Similarly, if you consider, say, air travel, with hundreds of flights of various airlines flying at different altitudes and with different, on different routes, but no control tower, no one to coordinate the traffic, and you know what kind of a chaos can emerge. Or consider a hospital with doctors and nurses filled with patients, but no one keeping any track of the medical records and tests. And in every case, we will find the results are disastrous. Same is the case with our own body-mind complex. Every part of our body, big and small, and the mind is designed to carry a very specialized function, a specialized task. Now, all of these tasks of the body and mind get coordinated and get unified through this entity called the ego or the I. It is this I that makes each one of us feel that we are a person. We are not just a collection of limbs. So what is this, this entity, just two hands, two legs, it just doesn't add up. That we are a person. We are not just a collection of parts. And what gives us that sense of personhood is the sense of I. So the first thing that the sense of I does is it separates me from everything that is not I. The second thing that it does is that it unifies and coordinates all the activities of my body and mind. The third thing, the third major function of the sense of I is that it's an identity maker. This is what I said earlier. If someone were to ask me, who are you? Um, or if I were to ask myself, who am I? Every answer to this question, who am I, would be affirming some identity. Now that identity can be very, very general. Um, well, we generally would say, well, who am I? I'm a human being. It seems like a very, more or less a very general answer. But that answer or that identity can be even more specific. It could be the question who am I, or who you are, can be answered through more specific identities related to, say, cultural, religious, sports, politics. So who are you, or who am I? Um, from a very specific political angle or cycle, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. From a sports thing, I could say I'm a, I'm a Red Sox fan. And that's, that is a very valid answer to the question who you are. And we have these identities also relate with, related to the different relationships that we have. 
So I could say, well, I'm, I'm a son, or I'm, I'm a daughter, I'm a husband, I'm a wife, and so on. So the answers to the question, who am I, can be many. And each of those answers can be very accurate. Now, among these many answers to the question, who am I, some of these answers will stick with us for a lifetime. For instance, now if, we are, if we are human beings, then it's unlikely that we are going to answer that, who are you? That answer would probably <laughs> remain same all to, all from until we die. Some of these answers will change, clearly. If I change my political identity, maybe today I might say I'm a Republican, tomorrow, if, if my views change, that answer would change. But which among these identities, how fragile they are or how long-lasting they are, that's another one important field of study. The question that Vedanta asks is, among the various answers that are possible to the question, who am I, which of these, which of these answers are long-lasting? And among these long-lasting answers, is there any answer which will not change ever? Even, even the answer, for instance, that I am a human being is limited. Uh, because can we say that we were human beings before we were born? Can we say that we will continue to be human beings after we die? What is it that makes me a human being? We just have to say, well, a human body. What makes a dog a dog? Why isn't dog a human being? Well, because a dog is in a dog's body. So, so it's usually the body that determines uh, our identities. In these, the, 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 the identity as a species. Is there any identity that would not change with time, would not change with place, would not change if my ideas change? That is the kind of question Vedanta asks. And it arrives at one answer, and that is that there is an identity that I have which transcends the identity related to, with reference to the body, the mind, the ego, or an identity that is connected with any of these changing external factors, whether it's political, social, uh, national, religious, and so on. According to Vedanta, the, the sense of I does not own the body. The sense of I or the ego is only a coordinator or manager of this entity. The real owner is the spirit or the Atman or pure consciousness or what sometimes might be called as the God within us. Now, we cannot see the Atman, we cannot see who we really are, because that real eye is covered. And that coverings, and, the, and, and that's why in Vedanta texts, the, the different layers of our personality are seen as coverings. Sometimes they are called, uh, they are divided into five Category. So these are five layers called kosha in Sanskrit. There is a, the layer of the body, the, the prana, the mind, the intellect, and so on. Or sometimes they are called the three layers. So it doesn't matter how you divide it. The idea is that the real me is hidden, is covered. And because it is hidden, the, that which covers it, therefore, is... Um, has kept me ignorant of who I really am. So Sri Ramakrishna, in one, in his conversations, once pointed this out. The sense of I is what prevents me from knowing who I really am. The I itself becomes a major layer or a covering separating me from myself. Now this is what Sri Ramakrishna said. I and mine, these constitute ignorance. My house, my wealth, my learning, my possessions, 
the attitude that prompts one to say such things comes of ignorance. On the contrary, the attitude born of knowledge is, O oh God, you are the master, and all these things belong to you. House, family, children, attendants, friends are all yours. The idea here is this. All of these identities associated with, with wealth, with, with, with my possessions, with my learning, and so on, these, these identities wall me in, keep me limited. These are very specific identities which do not define me across the limitations imposed by mind and space. For instance, I could say, well, this is my house. Now, this is, cannot be a defining characteristic because tomorrow I might move, go to a different place. Then that which was seen as my home is no more my home because my home has gone to a different place. And so our, if our identities are associated with things which change, things which are destructible, then um, those identities are not very strong. We need to have an identity which is unshakable. This is what Ramakrishna says on page 208 of that book, The Gospel of Ramakrishna. He said, I and mine, that is ignorance. By discriminating or by discerning, you will realize that what you call I is really nothing but Atman. Reason it out. Are you the body or the flesh or something else? At the end, you will know that you are none of these. You are free from attributes. Then you will realize that you have never been the doer of any actions, that you have been free from the virtue and false alike, that you are beyond righteousness and unrighteousness, that is dharma and adharma. And yet, we know that life would be impossible without the sense of I. What do we do? We know that the sense of I is necessary. We know also that the sense of I, paradoxically, keeps me away from my own self. So how do we then deal with this I which seems necessary and yet troublesome? And so Sri Ramakrishna said that it's helpful to make a distinction between two kinds of eyes that we have. And he called them, um, not a, it's not a very philosophical term, but it's a term that, that drives home the idea very powerfully. And he called it the ripe eye and the unripe eye. According to Ramakrishna's teachings, it's the ripe eye that will free us, and the unripe eye will keep us more limited, keep us more vulnerable, keep us tied down to this world of fear, anxiety, and mortality. So what is this ripe eye? And that the eye that is associated with entities that are infinite, entities that are big, entities that are, that are powerful, um, those, that eye will keep me stronger. And sometimes you can see, even in our, in our, very, in our relative world, when we become when, when our eye is associated with something which is powerful and secure, we feel powerful and secure. Um, um, it's a little bit like this. The, the, if your team is really doing great, um, then you feel, you feel wonderful and you feel very powerful. If your team keeps on losing, whether it's baseball, football, or whichever game you, you, you are interested in, then you feel vulnerable. Your life doesn't seem that fun anymore. Uh, the same is true also of, say, being part of a group or a community or even a nation which is powerful. So we, just by being identifying with a powerful entity, we feel a sense of strength. Now what the religious teachers have taught is that what could be more powerful than the source of all power, the source of all strength. In theistic language, that source of all power, the source of all strength is God. In, in, a, in, in terms of, uh, in Vedantic terminology, that is the spirit, the undying spirit within us. So if my eye is associated in some way with this 
unchanging, powerful source of everything, I can be the most secure person. And that is why the ripe I would be that rather than me just tying myself down to this mortal human identity, if I can think of myself, make an effort to think of myself as I'm a child of God, I'm a servant of God, or in a more philosophical sense, I'm not just this body and mind, but I'm the spirit, the Atman, which is never born, it'll never die. It's eternally free. The more my identity is tied up with these, the, the spirit within or the divine everywhere, the stronger I become. In, in the language of devotion, this is how Sri Ramakrishna described the, what this ripe eye, what it can do for us. And these are Ramakrishna's words. O oh God, you alone do everything. You alone are my own, and you alone belong, and to you alone belong these houses, buildings, family, relatives, friends, the whole world. Everything is yours. It's ignorance that makes one feel I'm doing everything, I'm the doer. House, buildings, family, children, friends, property are all mine. But this way of thinking keeps us tied down to this world of mortality. So one helpful practice would be that when we use the word I all the time, we have to try. I'm sure it's, it might not be possible all the time, but at least if we can find at least some time in the course of a day when we have the leisure to, to pause a little bit. Every time you say the word I, you can ask yourself, who am I really referring to? Every time I say I, what is it that comes before my mind? And this kind of a self-analysis is very helpful spiritually. Because the world that we live in and how we understand the world is directly related to how we understand our own selves. When this fact is not often recognized, that why is it that we all apparently live in the same world, but our impressions about the world are not identical? It's quite, it's not at all unusual to meet someone and that person says, how wonderful this world is, so great, it's so, such fun to be in this world. And then someone says, this is terrible, this is the selfish, everyone is selfish, all are ter So, and we say, well, are we living on the same planet? So the reason is clearly our impressions of the world, not just, I mean, world is a very kind of a hazy, ambiguous um, term, are even impressions about people we move with. Actually, you come to think of it, we, although the, we use the word world all the time, even the word world is not at all clear because because we can use the word, what, what do we really mean when we use the word world? Are we referring to all these infinite galaxies, the physical extent of all this? Most of us are not even thinking about it most of the time. We're not even thinking about the solar system. We are, very few people are even thinking about the Earth as a planet. If people were, they would be more conscious about this climate change and all of it. So the world that we refer to most of us, most of the time, is a very small bubble. The world that we refer to is very self-referential. Only that which directly concerns me or indirectly is related to my interests, that's all that the world I live in and move in. And in the immediate proximity, to me in this world are the people I meet on the daily basis, are people who are in my address book, are people I sometimes call over the phone. And in the outer fringes of my little bubble are the, are the kind of names and figures I sometimes see when you go online or when you see on a television news or you hear the BBC. Again, so these kind of are somewhere in the distant parts of my little world. But most of the time, 
the world that we are all dealing with on a daily basis is a very small little place. And it's good, it's, it's, it's good to recognize the limitation, the, 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 the small world. Our own little world is pretty small, which is okay. But even in this little small world in which we, our lives are pretty much lived, it's good to see that what, is, what do I think of this little world of mine? And we will notice, if we think a little bit, that the world I live and move in is, and how I see it, is very much related to my understanding of myself. And as I mentioned on earlier occasions, why is it that I so effortlessly see everyone as a human being? I don't need to refer to any books. I don't need to uh, get any guidance that I instinctively know you're all human beings. The reason I have no difficulty identifying everyone as human beings is because I can effortlessly identify myself as a human being. There is no difficulty at all. But when we read things such as we are all children of God, that God is a father or a mother and we are all God's children, or God is the creator and God has created all of us. So that, that notion doesn't stick. I mean, we remember it now and then when, we, when someone mentions it to us. But every time you see someone, you think, oh, this is a beautiful creation of God. You never think about it that way. Uh, or you never say, oh, this is a child of God in front of me. The reason we don't, we, the reason that doesn't come naturally to us is because it doesn't come naturally to us to see ourselves as a child of God. So if every morning, if I can get up and I remind myself, I'm a child of God. God created me. And if I can keep on reminding myself that way, it'll become much easier then to see others as children of God. It'll become so much more easier to say, well, God created not just me, God created all of these people. So that I, that identity, which I tend to use more often, that becomes my dominant identity. So while we have several identities simultaneously, and I'm not meaning in some schizophrenic sort of way, I'm just referring in the philosophical way that, that it's possible to, ans to refer to oneself in many different ways, but there, is, there might be some particular way which might become consciously or unconsciously our favorite way of identifying ourselves. It's uh, sometimes I like to think about, like sometimes usually many people have um, more than one credit cards. And, uh, and everyone will have their own sets of rules about which card to use when or where. But over time, we might discover that we tend to use one card more often than others. Then that becomes like our dominant <laughs> card. And perhaps because it gives you greater benefits. In a similar way, the, the different identities that we have, so we have your political identity, your, your, your identity connected with your relationships, identity with your sports, your spiritual identity, and so on. So which of these identities is dominant? Which of these identities I tend to use more often in the course of a day? So the dominant identity would give me a better self-knowledge about, my, about myself. The well, self-knowledge would be about yourself. Uh, it's a tautology. Um, it's like this. If for someone, if, if, if my political identity keeps coming up more often throughout the day with, with the kind of contacts I have, with the kind of discussions I have, with the kind of readings I do, then such people will be sometimes, well, that's, that person is a political junkie. In, a, in the sense that that person political, like I'm a Democrat comes up above all, every other identity. Or if I'm, if I'm a crazy after sports, like I, I'm a Red Sox fan, then that might come up more often. So if I consider myself a spiritual person, if I consider myself that spirituality is not just one among the thousand things I'm interested in, that, and many of us do, like to see ourselves as spiritual. 
then this is a good test. If I'm really spiritual, among the several identities that I have, where does my spiritual identity stand? And there is, as I said, even for spiritual identity, there is not just one way of expressing it. It could be anything connected with your spiritual ideal or God. It could be you see yourself, see yourself as a son of God or a child of God or, or, a, or a servant of God, or you see yourself as the Atman, the spirit. You, 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 you are completely free to, to use any of the concepts that you're familiar with or any of the concepts that resonate with you. But if your spiritual identity keeps coming up more and more often throughout the day, and it's not, I'm, I'm by that I don't mean you have to go on declaring it to the world, that if someone asks you, who are you? I'm not suggesting that you immediately say, I'm a son, I'm a child of God. You don't have to publicize or advertise your thing. But deep down, as you go about your day-to-day -day activities, as you carry, about, carry out your duties and responsibilities, do you see yourself as the Atman? Do you see yourself, and even as a devotee of God, as a child of God? The more often I see that, then that becomes my dominant identity. And that's why, uh, just to conclude, one of the ways um, greeting is done in some parts of the world, definitely in the Indian subcontinent, is actually uh, very instructive in this regard. There is a word in Sanskrit uh, called swastha. Swa means the self. Stha means uh, established in or located in. And uh, if you literally, normally when we greet each other, we say, how are you? Um, so a similar phrase of greeting or inquiring how the person is in many uh, languages in India, and definitely in Sanskrit, but also in many other Indian languages, um, the, the phrase would sound something like this, are you swastha? Uh, which literally translated would, would mean, um, are you established in yourself? And by the word self clearly means not the self located with any of these other fragile, vulnerable contexts of the world, the self which is the real self, the real me hidden under these layers. If I'm, if I'm truly located there, then I'm really healthy. So the, even the word for health in Sanskrit is swastha, means located in oneself. As opposed to disease or illness, in Sanskrit become aswastha, means not located in yourself. So from a spiritual standpoint, if my I is anywhere outside the real me, I'm really ill. If my I is in real me, the real self, the true self, or what Vedanta might say, the Atman, the, or in a theistic language, the, the I is identified with, with as some way it's related to God. I either as a part of the divine being or a child of the divine being, any way you call it. If my I is related to the spiritual ideal in some way, then I'm really located in that true self. And then I can be considered completely healthy. So there is, just as there is physical health, mental health, we can speak in terms of spiritual health. And in order for us to reach that state of spiritual health, we have to think more deeply about this sense of I. Totapuri, the Vedanta teacher of Ramakrishna, you had this one, one brass vessel. Sometimes when in the, in the puja, when we have a puja at the Vedanta center, you might notice that there is one it's called a kind of a kamandalu-like structure from which I pour water. You sometimes you have seen me doing that. So, so Totapuri had had something similar, who was a, a Ramakrishna's teacher. And every day, he would he would um, clean that that vessel. He would spend long time cleaning it every day, and every day it wouldn't get that dirty either. But he would keep on cleaning it, keep on cleaning it. And once um, he was asked, well, why do you clean it every day? And then he said that um, 
if I don't clean it every day, then it'll gather this, its shine will go. And the, if I do it daily, then it can remain fresh as ever. Otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, it'll, it'll lose its shine. And that example is sometimes given to um, the sense of I that we have. If we, as spiritual seekers, we need to take a good look at the sense of I in our lives and wash it, wash it daily. If we wash it daily, clearing it of all the, the wrong connections that the I makes, then this I can truly become our friend. Then it will truly unify all the faculties that we have. It will coordinate the functions of the body and mind perfectly. It will show us the right way. It will not misguide us. It will help us make the right choices, take the right decisions. And in order to make that sense of I our real friend, uh, we need to wash it. And by washing it, I mean to look at it carefully every day and just ask oneself, is my I in the right place? So these are some of the ideas that come to mind when we reflect over the, the idea of I. And so just to, just to sum up, it's good to remember that the I is, is a pronoun grammatically. It's, it's a word, and it's a word that refers to an entity. And just because we know the word does not mean that we know the entity itself. Sometimes you just read, read some books or Google something, and you might be able to fire off some lots of complex words. Just because you can utter some words or know some big words doesn't necessarily mean you know exactly what those words stand for. And that is why the simple one letter word, I, um, for all its simplicity and for all the frequency of its use throughout the day needs a lot more attention, a lot more reflection from all of us in order for us to grow and develop spiritually. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohu. We bow down to Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. Next week, we will have um, Kali Puja. And in order to prepare for the worship of Kali, our topic for next satsang, next Sunday, will be understanding Kali. On Wednesday, we will continue our uh, study group. We are presently studying the 12th chapter of the Gita. So you are welcome for that at 7.30 in the evening. And Tuesday, um, Tuesday we will have meditation as usual, but in preparation for the Kali Puja, we will not have a meditation on, on Saturday. We'll conclude with a prayer now on page three of your books. the divine being who is the father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the great spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. 
Peace, peace, peace be unto all.